Hello, my name is MJ and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at Lifelong Kindergarten, Cultivating Creativity Through Projects, Passion, Peers and Play by Mitchell Resnick. In this book, Mitchell Resnick takes a look at the current and future needs of our society and asks whether the education system is setting students up for success. And unfortunately he finds that often that isn't the case. The current education system is good at developing students who are able to answer standard questions with standard answers, who are good at following instructions, but these are not the sorts of people that we need in the future. What we need is people who can take on complex problems and come up with creative solutions to them. He looks through the education system and he finds a time where this creativity and generativity is at its best. And that is kindergarten, a time where students are encouraged to play with finger paints or to work with building blocks, to find something to do with their peers. There's a lot of generativity in this time of life. And anyone who's ever been around a child and a big empty cardboard box will know the generativity of small children, the ability to invent a whole new world that this box could become a submarine, or this box could become a spaceship, or that this box could become a castle. Kind of the possibilities are endless. And it's almost in the fact that the cardboard box is not prescriptive about how to play with it, that it almost encourages that creativity. As soon as a toy becomes too prescriptive in how to play with it, the child almost starts to lose interest in it. Lego is such a popular toy because it doesn't tell you how to play with it. It says, choose how you want to play with me. What do you want to build? How do you want to build it? And I think that is a really key part of the creative process. And Mitchell Resnick has worked with Lego Mindstorms and so very much sees the importance of not being too prescriptive for children to allow them to take agency and be able to decide what they want to work on and how they want to work on it. He identifies four P's of cultivating creativity. The first P is projects. He sees that projects are really important for being able to give space for the learning process. He talks about the creative learning spiral, that a student starts off by imagining something, imagining a solution, imagining something they want to create, and then they start to create this thing that they have imagined. And hopefully that creativity develops into play and they start getting engaged into the process. And then they hopefully share what they have been working on with peers and the peers provide feedback and make suggestions for improvement. And the person whose project it is starts to learn how to receive that feedback. And maybe the peer says, hey, can you look at what I've been working on? And then the person learns how to be able to give feedback as well as receive feedback. And they also learn to reflect on what they've done. So they had imagined something and they created something and did it match up with what they had imagined? And how could it be improved after this? And that then means that the learning spiral continues so that the student can then start imagining, creating, playing, sharing and reflecting all over again. So the longer you can have a project, the better to create more space for this type of learning. The second P is passion. I think this is a really important thing to not be too prescriptive in the assignments and the tasks that the students are doing. Allow the student to take agency in deciding what they want to work on. Let them find something that they're interested in. They're much more willing to give their time to something that they're actually interested in rather than something that the teacher has said, this is what we're going to do. The third P is peers and the importance of the peer interaction. In our modern society, communication and collaboration are key. And we really need to develop these skills in the students. Peers also provide a great opportunity for feedback. How do I get feedback? How do I give feedback? How do I know if someone else's work is of good quality? How do I know if my work is of good quality? Peer interaction provides a really good platform 
for being able to discuss the quality of work and how work can be improved over time. Finally, he looks at play, and that's probably my favorite part of the book, to be honest. Um, I really think it's so important, whether you're a child uh, in school, whether you're in kindergarten, whether you're in higher education, whether you're in the workplace, if you can find the activities that you're doing playful, it's really important and engaging to try and hold on to that feeling. And I think there's a real problem with external motivators in this. Things like grades can really get in the way of developing that kind of playful attitude and spirit. And I would suggest that if we can try and get away from that, to be able to allow more space for the students to take risks, that would be so much better for our education system. And I think what we also need to do is develop moments of flow, allow the students to be able to enjoy uh, the experience and play and find challenges that are optimally difficult for them. Often, if somebody else is setting it, it might not be that optimal, but allowing the student the ability to be able to decide what they want to do allows them to be able to tailor the difficulty level. Because if something is too difficult, it can be overwhelming, or if it's too easy, it'll be boring. So allowing the student to be able to kind of playfully figure out where that challenge level is. The point of play is not that it becomes easy and is silly and can be laughed off. Play should be hard work. Play should take time. If you want to really play and enjoy something, it's going to take work. But it should be rewarding and enjoyable in the process itself. Anyway, I really enjoyed this book. I would highly recommend it. If you haven't read it, um, please do so. If you have read it, please let me know in the comments. One of the great things about this book is that it is very short. It's about 180 pages long or about four hours, 45 minutes if you listen to it as an audiobook. And I think it does really well to deliver quite a simple message uh, in quite a straightforward way about how we could revolutionize education. All right, bye for now.